saving his soul. In the Middle Ages, money could buy you the love of God and a place in heaven. Crusading was one way to get these spiritual brownie points. Another way was by building something big and bold for the church, like a cathedral. There are 24 medieval cathedrals in Britain. They took generations to construct. Building sites became home to whole communities of craftsmen and labourers who devoted their working lives to these monuments of medieval faith. Fortunately for us, we can get a bit of an idea of what working on a medieval cathedral would have been like because the Tower of St Edmundsbury is still under construction today. Here in 21st century Bury St Edmunds, there's plenty of mechanised help. 700 years ago, everything was done by hand, or rather by thousands of hands. Building a cathedral in a city was like bringing a new car plant to an area today. It provided hundreds of jobs high and low. But even prestigious workers like stonemasons had it tough. Before they even started building, they had the hellish tasks of quarrying and cutting and carting the raw stone to the building site. Andre Vrona is the most sought-after stonemason in the country and the master mason at Bury St Edmunds. He's brought me to Ketton Quarry near Peterborough to look for just the right piece of limestone for the St Edmundsbury Tower. Have people used this stone round here for building for a long time? Oh, it's been recorded as being used uh, from this area extensively since the uh, 15th century, certainly, to build manor houses, uh, cathedrals, mainly ecclesiastical buildings in, uh, north of here, south of here, and East Anglia. We're fortunate today because the, in, in this quarry, the strata is like been stripped in half for us, so we get a visual look at it. It's like slicing the cake in half and seeing what's in it. But they well, wouldn't have had the advantage of all that. They'd just be digging down. Down, exactly. How would they have dug a piece out? Ah, well, you can guess that these guys wedged and levered it and drove pins in. And they actually found an iron bar here, and they can't date it, but it's quite old, this iron bar, but it was a tremendous length with a big ball on the end and a chisel on the other end. And you can imagine that this guy could get 15 blokes hanging on the end of this thing, and they would have just got it into the actual strata of the stone underneath it and raised it, it's just a small amount. Nowadays, transporting big pieces of stone is pretty easy. But in the Middle Ages, it was a real problem. Basically, you had two alternatives. You could either use water, if there was a river nearby, or else you could use a cart, which was incredibly slow and very expensive. In fact, the cost of transporting the stone could be four times as much as the value of the stone in the quarry. And when you think that a lot of the stones of the English cathedrals came from Normandy, you can imagine how much the costs really escalated. So to save money on transport, there was a team of people whose entire day was spent cleaving the stone. All right, Andre, you've got modern technology, but how would the lads have cut up these blocks in the Middle Ages? Well, it's called delving and using plug and feathers. What's plug and feathers? Are these. Feathers and a plug that's tapered. It applies pressure and it splits. Go on then, show me how to delve. In medieval times, these holes were laboriously drilled with a hammer and spike. That one's tight enough, Tony. Oh, you can hear the different noise, can't you? Yeah, completely different. Yeah. So if you would like to just have a go. Yeah. A couple of taps on each one. Yeah. Oh, missed it. <laughs> Keep going. One more big one. There. We've oh, got look it. at that. Look at that. Oh, my God, it's opening up. That's extraordinary, that was like a little earthquake. It just, you just felt the whole stone move. See, I did hardly hit that at all. It's a simple thing, it's not a strength thing, it's a pressure, uh, and it's relatively s simple and easy. Oh, look, look at this, look at this. Look, it's gone right down to the bottom. That's amazing, it's so simple, isn't it? It is, yeah. Although there's various permutations and, and variations of it, it's basically the, the form of spitting stone to get these dimensional shapes up the quarry to save them carting waste from the quarry to the site, and this is how they did it. 
A medieval cathedral building site would have been a fantastic place. No one would ever have seen anything of this size and grandeur before, and it would have been absolutely teeming with workmen. Setters, hewers, layers, wallers, and of course the stonemasons. Higher wages, better paid, but it would have still been a job with plenty of dangers. The master mason at Canterbury Cathedral was a Frenchman called William and he was working on the scaffolding one day, this kind of height, when suddenly the whole scaffolding collapsed and he went plummeting down. Masonry and timber and scaffolding fell on top of him and he was so badly damaged he couldn't do his job anymore and they had to send him home and an Englishman took over. Yeah, keep going up David. Andre, it's amazing when you look down there. Look down, right down here. That is so vertical. Andre, do you think that the masons in the medieval period would have been able to make pillars this straight? Oh, there's no doubt that in some cases they would, but largely uh, ecclesiastical medieval buildings in this country didn't achieve that. Why not? Because uh, over such a long period that they were built, there would have been varying different skill levels for the masons. And different people. You've different built people this whole thing. In two or three years. They were 80 to 90 years. Yeah, the problems might get lost, mightn't they? There's That's right. Something a bit dodgy. Exactly, yeah. And they could have been left alone for whole five, six year periods. You don't know. It was nothing to say that it was continuous for all those years. Whereas you can be forgiven years ago for an inch, you pull it back online, but we're not allowed a quarter. So you're saying medieval masons might have done a bit of a bodge job? Yeah, often they did. <laughs> often they did. Okay. The St Edmundsbury right. project is using a medieval mortar made from lime. When it's mixed, it's harmless enough. But in the Middle Ages, making lime was a high-risk process for the lime burner. And believe it or not, the mortal danger came from chalk. Michael, why do you need chalk to make cathedrals? I need chalk so that I've got something to make lime from by heating the chalk up. If I can heat chalk up to red heat and hold it at red heat for a while, it'll change quite to a quite different chemical, although it'll still look much the same. And what does the lime do? The lime, I think, holds the whole thing together. It uh, binds together the grains of sand to make a mortar, and the mortar holds the stones apart in a gentle cushioning sort of way. I'm going to put a few pieces of chalk into the bottom of this. The first stage was making quicklime, a highly caustic alkali. This is a small-scale version of the process that medieval lime burners used in their giant kilns. It was potentially deadly. Keeping the lime kiln happy means watching it day and night for perhaps 48 hours. If the burning isn't completely effective, they can create carbon monoxide. What does that do to you? It's horrible. It paralyzes you first and then kills you. It poisons your blood. It stops your blood taking in oxygen. During the process of the burn, it's not unknown for people to fall in the kiln and not be able to get out again. So they roast as well. Driving off the oxygen in the kilns was dangerous enough. That was only half the job. The resulting quicklime was added to water to make slaked lime used for making mortar. And it was a very risky business. Okay. I'll try and show you that on a slightly bigger scale. I brought along some lumps of quicklime. Very dangerous stuff. Why I'm wearing gloves, because it'll eat through my hands in no time at all. I'm going to try a Roman technique yeah. to imitate the sort of lime that we're using on the site. What, like this? In this powder form. So this powder, powder form of lime is much, much safer than quicklime. And this is the powder that you make the mortar with. But how do you get that into powder? by adding water. It does, sound, does not sound likely, but that's the case. It's hugely dangerous. Why is it dangerous? What does it do, this it stuff? It could spit like nobody's business. So how did that affect the lime burners? Um, it was nasty. The caustic action of this on their skin was dreadful. When it got into their eyes and their mouths, yeah. they were in real trouble. Whoa! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, it really goes, doesn't it? I'm going to put that in there to make it a bit safer. Yeah. But can you see how that lump has crumbled already? Yes. That was like fireworks. Quicklime oh. is very thirsty material. I mean, if any of that got on your skin, it could be very painful. Indeed. And they'd be handling this stuff every day, and the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning, and the quarrying, and the long nights, and the dust. They didn't live too long. It was... Over quick. 
Imagine what it would be like walking mile after mile after mile after mile after mile and getting absolutely nowhere.